Not in studio, yeah, but via we telephone. Ahead, we all have trouble understanding what you mean by social assassin. We have no trouble at all recognizing what you mean by social assassin. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't clarify. No, 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 no. We, no. Keep, keep all three syllables, please. Yeah, the, the social assassin is is after a uh, episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm in season eight, episode three, I believe it is. It's the, I think it's the Palestinian chicken episode where uh, they call Larry David the social assassin because he says things publicly that other people think but don't have the courage to say, and he says it. So that would be Mr. Gilstrap. He he speaks his mind freely on the program via telephone. Delegate John Hardy. John, good morning. Hey, good morning. How's everyone this morning? We're great. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. You still in Charleston? No, I'm back. I'm back in the uh, Panhandle, fighting a little bit of a of a cold. I got there the last of the session, so mm -hmm. just, uh, you know we just trade that stuff back and forth through, through the session. It's, it, you know, there's always at least five or ten people that's got something. So, does anyone leave Charleston healthy? <laughs> uh, you know, it's so funny. Um, sometimes I walk out on the back patio and I have no idea what the weather's going to be because you're just, like we call it, living under the dome and just, you know, sometimes you're inside 14, 16 hours a day. I feel like I'm never outside. I don't know what the weather's going to be. I, I, you you kind of lose the news cycle. You just, you really just, you know, it's a, it's a different world when you're down there in legislative session. You're just, uh, and I'm sure other delegates have told you this, you're just kind of, just you know, living inside the Capitol. The top 300 of us that work, you know, very closely together every day, and so yeah, you're just kind of trading every, your germs back and forth with each other. So, well, that sounds like fun. Yeah, uh, yeah. What a cesspool. Or not? In many, in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this was uh, your last turn down there, right, John? Yeah. So this is my last. This was my last legislative session as a you know as a uh, House member. So uh, very uh, very different session. Uh, the first part of the session was very slow and just really not it didn't get really uh aggressive and really get moving until about the last two weeks and then the last two weeks uh you know once crossover day hits uh it, it business picked up and and uh, it kind of got a little crazy especially the last uh last three or four days which is always you know just really busy time um you're looking at you know 14 usually 10 to 14 hour days in, in the capital and I think we had a couple of days where we had nine hour floor sessions and, and that's just typical. It's just, that's just part of it. Uh, I understand in, in reading the Metro news article that there will be an opportunity for voters in November. HJR 28 will put before the voters in November a proposed amendment that says no person, physician or healthcare provider in the state shall participate in the practice of medically assisted suicide, euthanasia or mercy killing of a person. That will be something people can vote on in November, John? Uh, yeah, I believe that made it across the finish line. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that's a big uh, – I'm not sure a lot of that's happening right now in the state. I guess maybe there were some people that wanted to be proactive. Uh, that came back over, and there was an amendment, and they said that that that, uh, that didn't count towards the death penalty. Now, we don't have the death penalty in the state of West Virginia, but uh, there was some strange legislation proposed this year. There was some – it was just some really off the wall stuff that came out this year, and some of it got traction. And I, mean, I was just, uh, I, I was a little perplexed at some of the stuff I saw this year, but it is what it is. John, you got a lot of love. With, well, John, uh, before you go there, Bill, I want to get one more constitutional yeah. amendment on the ballot. HJR 21 puts a constitutional amendment before the voters to prohibit anyone not a U.S. citizen from voting in the state. Passed the House February 6, went through two Senate committees, was amended, and didn't come to the Senate floor until last Monday. So that's another, is there anything else that's going to be on the ballot that voters will be uh, able to cast a, a ballot for or against? Not that I'm aware of. I'm, <clears throat> I'm hoping that we can get the, um, get back to uh, the budget cycle where, or get back to the voting cycle with the uh, personal uh, property tax, uh, get that. So that's kind of a convoluted system that we're using now. Uh, I think that people, um, you know, once we do that for a year or two, people are going to understand that, and uh, we'll be able to get that passed, and and hopefully uh, we'll, we won't have to use this convoluted tax system that we're using now where that's returned to you dollar for dollar on your state income taxes that we will be able just to uh, go ahead and eliminate that completely. Good, Bill. Yeah, uh, John, uh, welcome back. Uh, you got a lot of love last week, last couple of so weeks, when you took the position that uh, – that. <clears throat> 
the legisl- that there's not a lot done this time in, uh, with the session. And that's the sense I have. And the argument has been there we got all the low-hanging fruit last year, and there was not really anything to do this year. But that runs counter to a lot of the needs that we have, uh, such as uh, there's still problems with the correctional system. There's still problems in DHHR with the uh, uh, Child Protective Service. There's problems with our schools. There's problems with our uh, school security. You can go down the list. There's a lot of problems we still have in front of us. So I don't really buy into this argument. Uh, there was no low-hanging fruit. Uh, what was the reason it was so slow this year, John? Well, I will tell you, um, you know, this year, like I said, I think I said earlier on the show that all the constitutional officers were running, so there's no legislation. Uh, you know, they're all kind of moving positions or changing positions, and wasn't much legislation from the constitutional officers. The governor didn't really propose a lot, and his his budget was very vanilla. Um, the $465 million clawback right in the middle of the budget cycle really put a wet blanket on things. Uh, it was just kind of one of those years where, you know, there wasn't a lot of legislation run. I think that there's – I will think that – we'll say that I think a lot of the, the of the Republican priorities have been accomplished. And I do think that there's still work to be done in those areas that you said, corrections and DHHR and in and, and those different areas. I think there's been – in the last two years, there's been a lot of policies put in place uh, in those uh, agencies, and I think sometimes we as legislators just need to kind of pump the brakes and let those policies percolate. Uh, it takes them a little while to work, and, and then sometimes we can put a, a policy in and watch it for a year or two and then kind of see how it's starting to unfold and then and then try to work on it from there. So sometimes it's hard to constantly be putting – new and more policies in when we really aren't sure how some that we've already passed are, are, are if they're effective or ineffective. I will tell you there's been a lot, a lot of scrutiny and a lot of uh, insight in watching DHHR and the, the breakup of that agency and see how that uh, is going to work. And I think we're very, very you know early in that process. And it's going to take a couple years to kind of see if breaking that apart and uh, some of the policies that we've put in place for the CPS workers, and the, there's a sliding scale of pay for them in, in different areas. And so I just think we're just going to need a little time to see exactly how these policies are going to take place. Morning, John. Does the the $465 million clawback, uh, we, we've talked to a number of people, Mike Hornby among them. It seems like it's sort of being mischaracterized. Is, is it sort of de- developing to be kind of a nothing burger? It's, it's more of a, an administrative mistake that, that we just need to reorganize the, the categories of monies that's already been spent? Or are we going to have to write a check for $465 million and give it back to the federal government? No, I think your first statement is, is more correct. It's a big, giant nothing burger. I think the biggest problem was at the time that it came it came right in the middle of our budget cycle and 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 the real problem with it is and, and and i'm the first one to be very critical of you know any agencies or any branches of government that have done anything wrong and i i really don't think that anyone's done anything wrong in this instance i think it's just the rules changing i mean the, the monies came to the executive branch that money was divvied out to the uh, state board of education and then it trickled out to the county boards of education and and um, the rules just kept changing. I mean, the you know you have your you know your local county uh, school administrators trying to distribute that money as quickly as possible as they're told to do, um, and then the rules kept changing. And so I think really, if you look at it, it was just if you look at the proportional amount of spending that the state done versus the proportional amount of spending that the edu- that we spent on education, that's where the feds got concerned. So I think you know we've proposed. Now, we haven't received – we need to be careful. We have not received a letter from the executive branch stating that, you know, what the federal government says we can do extra spends on that will be, um, you know, go towards that. But we have an idea. We we did uh, do uh, $150 million into the school building authority, uh, you know, which we're hopeful that that will go towards the clawback. Uh, We've also – we did a teacher's pay raise. Uh, We've talked about doing an additional payment into our educators our retirement program, um, which that that uh, retirement is, is in, in really good shape. Uh, we're, um, I think 2032, we will have that, or 2030, 2032, something that will be completely funded at, at around uh, 
ninety percent, and and typically when you get your retirement funds at ninety percent, they are they're completely funded. Um, so so you know we're in we're in conversations. I think the biggest issue was was the timing, and we just need the executive branch to continue to negotiate with the federal government and come back and say, hey, this is what we have to do. John, a pay raise was passed for state workers who pay, who uh, whose pay scales are in state code. Uh, who does that not cover? So school teachers and state troopers and uh, service personnel, those are in code, and then the others typically will follow it within the budget. So so we'll pass the pay raise for those uh, because they're in statute, and then all the others will receive their pay raises through the money that we put into the general revenue budget. The article says state police get a $2,900 annual salary increase, teachers get 2460 and school service personnel get an additional $140 a month. Right. And we have to pass legislation to raise their, to give them a raise because they're in statute. The other ones we will just do in the budget. So in the general, in the general revenue budget, the monies will be uh, allocated for the other agencies to do their pay raises. Have you successfully phased out all social security taxes over time? Yes. Three years. So we, that was a compromise bill. That was one of the things that, that caused me a little heartburn. We, uh, the House was kind of in the posture of, you know, just phasing that out, and the Senate wanted a three-year phase out, which, you know, that's a more fiscally responsible way of doing it. It wasn't a huge lift. It was $37 million. Um, you know, 40 other states have already cut Social Security taxes so completely, so I didn't think it was. But, you know, we, we made a deal with the Senate to, to do that for a three-year phase out, and we thought that was a done deal, and then the Senate at the you know, and I'm not talking anything negatively about the Senate, but they changed their plan at the end and was trying to tie it to triggers, and we weren't very happy about that. So, but I think there, there was a there was a lot of horse trading going on there the last three four days, and I, you know, everybody's playing games, and it's a uh, it's just an interesting thing to watch. You know, the Senate could have put those triggers in there just to kind of get some legislation that they wanted out of the House. So, you know, it's there's a lot of gamesmanship, and sometimes you got to play a good game of chicken so it's a it's it's an interesting process and by the way to clarify it's it's not the phase out of social security taxes it's a state phase out of state income taxes on social security earnings also to clarify thanks to delegate mike height hjr 21 the constitutional amendment uh regarding um uh, anyone not a u.s citizen from voting in the state uh, Mike said that uh, ultimately was killed, actually, and, and, and died. Didn't isn't going to be yeah, on the I was, ballot. Yeah, I was a little hesitant to, to answer that. I wasn't sure if that made it across the finish line. I, I didn't, you know, the late night uh, bills are coming over, Senate messages are coming over. We're trying to clear our calendar of third stuff that's still on third reading, and you know, ultimately bills die. I mean, it was probably uh, you know. 30 bills that was sitting and sending messages and we're sitting on third reading that we just ran out of time. So, and the Dems did their job. They were doing a little filibustering and talking slow and asking lots of questions that they knew the answers to, but Hey, that's the game. That's, that's what they're supposed to do. And they, they did what they were doing. So John, as you're making the transition from a state level of government to quite possibly a, uh, a local level of government, were there any laws that that would impact the counties that, passed or ones that were disappointed that they they did not pass well yeah there was uh there was some legislation that that uh you know that worked to help the county uh worked on a piece of legislation that was kind of a fix for a bill that i passed about three years ago which was the uh the way that the fire fees could be raised uh it had to go out for public referendum and uh so we kind of changed that the the really the county commission would be the one that would would uh ultimately put that on the on the ballot and and how it would be put on the ballot so they can take the recommendation now from the fire board originally the fire board put it on uh, so that was a piece of cleanup legislation that we worked on i was worked on that uh, i had a water shutoff bill that i was working on for municipalities and that i kind of got it uh, in a better posture i don't think it's exactly how i wanted it but there was some compromise there uh there was the impact fee bill that was passed for berkeley county uh I, I had some hesitations on that bill. I, I, I really felt as a running for county commission, I was kind of in a, you know, I was kind of in a tough spot. Uh, you know, I, I, if I voted for it, people would say, well, John Hardy's going to, now he wants to raise, you know, impact fees on builders and people who want to build homes in Berkeley County. 
But if I didn't vote for it, then people would say, well, he doesn't want to control any type of growth or or try to, uh, you know, be able to have more money for our infrastructure. And that's what that money will be used for. It'll be used for police, fire, ambulance, and different types of infrastructure that the county needs. So uh, I was a little, you know, I had conversations about it. The the bill passed with overwhelming, uh, you know, support. So I think the biggest part now with that piece of legislation is, is the local guardrails and i and i think we have a wonderful commission right now and i think that there will be plenty of guardrails put on that bill the the only thing that concerns is we have to think about where our legislature or where our commission could be 10 15 20 years from now so i I think it's important to with the the city and county commission that we have now to make sure that the guardrails uh, are put in place and uh, we don't get overzealous with that piece of legislation. The lib- so-called library bill, where there's a uh, uh, removed exception for librarians, school teachers, the obscene material, did that, go- did that was that passed? I think that bill ended up... Yeah, that died, John. That yeah, died. Okay. Yeah, I was pretty sure that it did. It went back over to the Senate. It got heavily amended over there. I think the House refused to concur. Uh, we sent it back to the Senate for them to uh, work on it some more, and I think it just died. The uh, Delegate Wayne Clark uh, had uh, been involved in some sponsorship of a bill which would have made it a bit easier for wineries and breweries in West Virginia to do business with samples and such. Uh, I, I understand that that did pass, John. Do you know? It did. It was very. It was close. I mean, uh, I was talking with Wayne, and he was getting very nervous. I, I was getting a little nervous with my water bill. I was over there yelling at Householder going, where's my Senate message? Where's my Senate message? And poor Householder, you know, he's he's uh, and he's over there, and he's just working as hard as he can trying to get these Senate messages read, and everybody's over there screaming at him and trying to get their stuff put to the top of the list. And, and Wayne was, you know, Wayne was pacing back and forwards, and, and uh, uh, we finally got that winery bill done, I think, around 1030 you know, on Saturday night, but we, we did get that finished. And I think that was a good piece of legislation. Delegate John Hardy, our guest here on the program. John, in regards to creating additional jobs or business in West Virginia, was there anything else of meaning that passed that you saw? Uh, there was a bill that we did for Berkeley County for a proposed economic development. Um, you know, I heard Hornby talking about it on Thursday. Maybe he has more insight on that. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I know that there's a proposed $50 million project in Berkeley County. I don't know who it is, where it's at. I mean, there's lots of speculation. I'm not going to speak on where it may be or who it may be, but there was a piece of legislation that was passed uh, for an economic development project in in Berkeley County that's really in its early stages, but hopefully that'll happen. And uh, so that that was passed. And uh, so, yeah, there's, you know, there was always economic development projects that we're working on throughout the state. There's a specific question, and I remember the discussion about this from uh, Michelle McWilliams Coffee, and this is a bill that would have prohibited municipalities from disconnecting water for failure to pay a storm water fee. John, do you know much about yeah. the development of that bill? Hey, that was my bill. So that was oh, my, my bill. Actually, my bill got held up uh, in the House, and we just did a striking insert of my bill into Jason Barrett's bill. Me and Jason have gotten into the last couple of years uh, whatever whatever legislation that I put in in the House. Uh, if he has any interest in it, he'll put it on the Senate side. So we have two vehicles moving in case one of them get held up, and then we can always amend them or do striking inserts and so make sure we have a vehicle. And, and I will tell you, Senate vehicles always move easier, faster, and better than House vehicles do. Uh, we was able to pass that out of the, out of the, out of the Senate in a Senate version. And, and, yeah, basically what we did, we just put a lot of guidelines against municipalities, what they have to do before they can – turn people's water off it was really hard to go in and just say you couldn't do it because so many municipalities had had done what you should do uh when you're in those type situations is any type of revenue stream that you have you encumber that as soon as possible put a bond against it put it in you know put it into one of your uh your bond and so now it's a little harder to take that money from people we we put a lot of restrictions and a lot of onerous uh, responsibility in for the municipalities to be able to do that now. Disagreements between the House and the Senate bills on school discipline and how to handle children who are disrupted in the classroom uh, failed to merge, John, into an effective bill that made it across the finish line. Nothing out of that? No, that bill, 
Red Bill died on the last night. You know, it was uh, that that bill didn't make it across the finish line. Why I mean, wasn't that we, a plain vanilla bill? Where was the pushback on that? Nah, well, I mean, you just it just good talk. You know, I don't sit on the judiciary for a reason. Those guys, man, they can talk something to death. <laughs> I mean, in finance, if we talk about a bill in finance for more than fifteen or twenty minutes, it's probably a bad bill. In judiciary, it's common practice to talk three three hours about a bill. So. I mean, it's just making sausage over there. John, a quick clarification, at least from my perspective. Uh, we're talking about the municipality uh, cutting off from a, a stormwater fees. Uh, does that imply, does that pertain to counties as well as municipalities? I think there was counties. Was I think a county? I think Jason amended counties into that, but Berkeley County is the only county in the state that has an MS4 permit yeah. uh, that has a stormwater management fee. And Berkeley County is not doing that presently now, so I think Jason was just trying to uh, expand that to make sure that we were we had coverage for that in the municip- in the uh, counties also. I think there's probably a few other counties that are probably going to get MS4 permits whether they want them or not, uh, just due to the I would call it the overreach of the uh, Clean Water Act from the uh, federal EPA. Um, so I think Jason was just being proactive at that. Hey, John, I want to go back to the uh, impact fees and the discussion of the guardrails that are built into how, how the uh, funds are spent. Are the guardrails built into the legislation that was passed, or is it up to the county commission to put those guardrails into the the funds once, once they get them? This will make Bill Stubblefield very happy. It is local control. So this is local control. The local county commission really has the... Uh, the ability to set the criteria for the amount of the impact fees, how the impact fees will be utilized, uh, and how they'll be implemented. So there's a lot of uh, uh, work to be done on that at the local level. So, you know, I, I, I've got my own thoughts of what I think uh, should or shouldn't happen with those, and, uh, and I'll be making my thoughts be known to the, to the county commissioners, and uh, hopefully we'll be allowed to uh, at least have some input on that process uh, as a legislator to see, you know, how, how what their thoughts are on implementation. And but 20 years from now, this could be an open spigot. It could be, and I think that it, it needs to be, uh, I think we really need to take our time and get this right. Yeah, and I think that you're you're wise to let it go to local control there. The local folks know what's needed more so than anybody else. Well, that that's yet to be seen. Let's see where we are in five or ten years. And, <laughs> I mean, let's, we'll, we'll see, Bill. Yeah, but so. if you look historically, so you cannot look forward, but you look historically, uh, I think the county commission, whoever the member, whatever the makeup of the county commission, county council, they've done a pretty darn good job of taking care of the county. But they've always been poor. No, they've never. I mean, they've always been restricted on what they can spend. Yeah. Hey John, I want to read. I want to read to you the last couple of paragraphs from Hoppy's commentary today about the legislature. I don't want to be overly critical of the legislature because in my time there over the past two months, I have come to know many lawmakers who are good and decent people who are carrying out what they believe to be the reason why they were sent to Charleston. But something feels off to me. I sense an increasing level of dysfunction that may be linked to one-party rule and the nationalization of our politics. Perhaps this session was a one-off. And the 2024 election will serve to recalibrate our governing body. What do you think about that from Hoppy? I would say that the def- definitely that the Republican caucus is in a little flux right now. I mean, I I lost two votes on the House floor. And I, I typically, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't typically lose on the House floor. Um, I lost a, uh, a, a, as the vice chair of finance, uh, I was fighting against an amendment that was trying to be put into a bill and, and uh, I lost, and the amendment was put in the bill. I don't think it was very harmful to the bill, but uh, I lost on the House floor, and I also lost, uh, which I thought was a really bad piece of legislation that ended up dying uh, that was proposed out of the uh, Technical and Infrastructure and Technology Committee. I uh, tried to have it uh, referred back to finance because it had a fiscal implant, uh, uh, had a fiscal impact, and there was it never came. We never saw it, and. Uh, I lost that vote. So I, you, there's definitely uh, the, the legislature is a little bit in flux right now. It's going to really depend on who's elected next year. Uh, the new, a lot of new candidates coming in. I think there was 
14 of us that, that are leaving that knew we were leaving. There's probably some others that are leaving that don't know they're leaving. And, and uh, so it's, it's going to be an interesting makeup. I'm, I will watch the legislature very closely next year. I'm sure that I will be down there, uh, you know, as much as I possibly can be, rep, you know, trying to, uh, to, to uh, represent Berkeley County if I'm successful in my county commission race. And even if I'm not, I'll probably still be down there trying to represent Berkeley County because uh, I love the people and I love the process. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it, it, it was a very interesting year. So do you think then, John, based on what you're saying, that because so many of you folks were people who weren't going to be around the next year, it made it a lot easier for people who otherwise may have listened to you for fear of future reprisals? This time they're like, hey, he's gone. We can do what we want. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I got uh, – yeah, I, I got uh, I, I you know I got my feelings hurt a couple times down there this year, and uh, you know I'm I'm usually pretty good on the floor, and I usually can you know sway it, but uh, there's a couple times I you know I did kill off a bunch of amendments to the budget, so let's talk about that. That's the most important piece of legislation that we done that got done very late on the last night. I was very worried we were going to have to work Sunday or maybe even going. I, I, they were talking about going into a budget conference in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I just knew. I knew in my heart of hearts that the Senate president was going to do everything that he could do not to go into a budget conference, uh, and, and, and the speaker also, and the finance chairs, and we were working really hard not to have to do that. But we didn't pass the budget. We passed a very vanilla budget about 1030 on Saturday night. $4.996 billion, just under $5 yeah. billion. Yeah, but if you look at it, Section, section 9, which is our surplus revenues, is almost empty, and that's where we – uh, we we left a lot of money on the table due to the clawback, and there's going to be a special session, um, I think, the week after the primary in May, because we'll have all of the answer, all the questions answered on the clawback stuff, and uh, so then we'll be able to really we can put together one large amendment to the budget because the budget doesn't go in effect until July one, so we can put together one large amendment in the House Finance Committee to um, uh, put monies back into the budget that we did not have in the budget that we passed uh, late Saturday night. So if you look back in that Section 9 where all of our surplus revenue stuff is, I think there's maybe three or four items back there, and uh, that's where a lot of uh, proposed legislation that I had was going to go. And so I'm still in negotiations with the governor's office and uh, the finance chairs to hopefully get some uh, – legislation done in may that i couldn't get done in the regular session john appreciate your time this morning thank you kindly yeah sounds good thank you all for having me i appreciate it take care thanks john that'll get john hardy at 9 35